The 1996 film Fargo by Joel and Ethan Coen is both a critical and a commercial success. It did very well at the box office. It was nominated for and won several awards, both the Academy Awards and the Cannes Film Festival. And it spawned actually two television series, including one that is quite critically acclaimed and just finished its third season on the FX network. And yet, were you to ask most people what they think of when they think of the movie Fargo, they're probably going to give you the same answer. Those accents. Oh, you betcha, yeah. Yeah. And that's not such a bad thing, because the accents are incredibly important to figuring out what's going on in the movie. The Coens describe that accent as Minnesota nice, and that actually refers not just to the way that words are formed, but the way that people interact with one another. This sort of constant demand for civility and politeness, no matter how much you may be desperate or how much you may actually hate the person to whom you're talking. Hi, my name is Joe George, and you are watching Renewed Mind Movie Talk, a weekly series in which we take a look at a piece of popular culture and examine it through Christian theology. This week we're looking at Fargo, which is a little bit of a difficult movie. Fargo is a crime story set in Minnesota and North Dakota. It is about a man who arranges for his wife to be kidnapped and held for ransom so he can extort money from his father-in-law. The plot goes awry. He ends up being followed by this small town policewoman who eventually solves the case. That sounds like a fairly simple plot, right? But it's difficult to talk about because there's something weird in the Cohen brothers' tone. Throughout their career, which is fairly lengthy now, the Coens have been charged by critics that their movies invite audiences to laugh at the characters in a way that's condescending or cruel. And we definitely see that in Fargo. Are we supposed to be mocking the Minnesota nice politeness? Or are we supposed to be genuinely moved by it? As you're going to see in our discussion, it's kind of a little bit of both in a way that I think is instructive for us as Christians. Oh. <laughs> That's the tone that the Coens often strike. Simultaneously horrible on a humane level, but also comic on a cosmic level. And there's this sense kind of overall that, especially in a white blank landscape like we find in Fargo, that our individual actions don't matter so much. They're all kind of comically absurd. Doesn't matter what you do, you might end up with a bag over your head running through the wilderness. Or, as happens to another character kind of famously, you might end up shoved in a wood chipper. For reasons that I'm going to get into in just a minute, that's part of the necessity of Minnesota Nice. We have to be kind to one another in a cruel world because without it, nobody else is going to make us feel meaningful. And yet, Fargo is also filled with men who try to exploit this niceness for their own good. The most prominent of these is Jerry Lundegaard, played by William H. Macy. He is, on the one hand, a seemingly good man. He is a family man. He has a job as a car salesman. He is unfailingly polite throughout the movie. He doesn't curse much, and only in the most desperate situations, but instead of cursing most of the time, he says these, these little nice things like, You're darn tootin'. He seems like a very nice guy. And yet, we see that he, he actually kind of uses politeness to manipulate people. We get this scene in which he's coercing a customer into paying more for a car than the guy actually wanted. He keeps trying to deflect the guy's genuine anger at being told one thing and finding another by going back to this politeness over and over again. On top of that, we see that Jerry's kind of a loser in a way that makes us sympathize for him. You know, he's, he only has his job because his father-in-law gave it to him and his father-in-law is fairly overbearing and repeatedly indicating to Jerry how much he dislikes him. Deals go bad for Jerry, things go sideways, and even nature seems to be conspiring against him. So we get the sense of this powerless guy whose only recourse is politeness in deals, and he's trying to use that to his advantage. The other character who does this is Carl Showalter, played by Steve Buscemi. Although you might not think so, since one is a car salesman and the other one is a criminal, Jerry and Carl actually have quite a bit in common. 
First of all, they're not terribly respected and they're both kind of losers. You know, throughout the investigation, Carl is repeatedly referred to as the little guy who's kind of funny looking. He is stuck with this sort of taciturn partner who doesn't give back any conversation or anything he needs. And most importantly, he's not vouched for by other criminals, which makes him kind of a tag along guy in the same way that Jerry kind of tags along with his father-in-law. Worse, Carl comes to a ridiculous end. First, he is shot in the face by Wade, Jerry's father-in-law. Second, he is attacked and killed by his partner with an ax. And then finally, he gets shoved into a wood chipper with only his foot remaining. It's a bad end for Carl. And yet, despite as vulgar as he is, Carl, like Jerry, believes in a sort of polite society, or at least an, a, a, an honest society. You see, Jerry is constantly referring back to the language of deals. That's how he handles people at the car lot, and that's how he handles the criminals. This idea that you say you're going to do this, and then I say that I'm going to do this, and we're going to both work together for our own good. And so when things start going sideways for him with his father-in-law, with people at the car dealership, with the criminals, Jerry is legitimately flabbergasted. He thought this is the way that the world works and doesn't understand why it doesn't. Carl kind of does the same thing. You know, at the very first proper scene of the movie, when Carl and Jerry are meeting one another, Carl is angry because he was told Jerry was going to be there at 7.30, Jerry shows up at 8.30. And even though Carl tries to change the deal with Jerry in order to get more money, later on he cites justice and fairness when he thinks he's being mistreated by his partner. This is a world in which no greater justice exists. This is a world in which no fairness exists or uh, manners that are anything other than a silly attempt to act dignified in a cruel world. And that's why the hero is so important. Our hero here is Marge Gunderson, a pregnant married police officer who is uh, investigating the murders that she finds in Brainerd that were done by Carl and his partner. Like all the other characters, Marge believes deeply in treating people nicely. Even when she has to question her partner's police work, she does so politely. Even when she has to be a little bit hard on a witness, in this case Jerry, who's being evasive, she does so politely. She constantly refers back to this idea of treating people nicely and fairly, even when it inconveniences her. Now Marge might be our hero, but that doesn't mean that she's exempt from the rest of the movie's worldview. She is also mistreated because of her politeness. Most prominently in this scene with an old high school classmate who invents this story about his dead wife in order to make a move on Marge. She clearly doesn't really want to talk to him that much and is made uncomfortable by what he's doing, and yet this sense of decency of politeness compels her to keep going. More importantly, it never even occurs to her that he is lying, which eventually she finds out that he is, nor does it occur to her that Jerry, when they first talk, is lying because she's too polite to think these things. Now, where the politeness falls apart for the other characters, Marge eventually sort of wises up. She figures out that Mike is lying and uses that information to figure out that Jerry's lying and comes back and completes the investigation and eventually uh, catches the criminals not quite in time to keep Carl from ending up in the wood chipper or to save Jean, but enough to at least bring the partner to justice and Jerry to justice. But importantly, she never turns away from the idea of politeness throughout. She can do both. She can look at the fact that people might lie or mistreat one another. She can even look directly into the facts of this, of this case and find that two people, or five people rather, were murdered for almost nothing, but then can still believe in fundamental human decency, which is why the movie ends with her kind of going back to her husband and having this nice domestic moment between the two of them. Just because politeness is superficial doesn't mean that there's not something human and important behind it. So that was Mrs. Lundegaard on the floor in there. And I guess that was your accomplice in the wood chipper. And those three people in Brainerd. And for what? 
for a little bit of money. Towards the end of Mere Christianity, this book in defense of the Christian faith written by C.S. Lewis, there's a chapter called Nice People or New Men. In that chapter, Lewis addresses this question, why aren't Christians the nicest people in the world? And he says that's a reasonable question because you would th think that um, if Christianity transforms you into a good person, then certainly you would always be good. He unpacks that assumption on a number of levels. Um, the, the two most important are these. First of all, well, it's a process at work, right? Somebody that is really not nice, it's going to take a little bit longer for them to transform into a nice person than somebody who already starts out as really nice or really good or whatever metric we're using to describe goodness in that particular case. The more important issue, though, that Lewis comes back to is this, that it's not really about niceness or goodness in that way. Instead, he says, quote, but we must not suppose that even if we succeed in making everyone nice, we should have saved their souls. A world of nice people, content in their own niceness, looking no further, turned away from God, would be just as desperately in need of salvation as a miserable world. It might be even more difficult to save. What he means there is that the whole project of Christianity, while it is about transforming the way that the world works, that's often a process that involves sometimes kind of busting down what we think is nice in that society, right? That there's a certain sort of desperation that comes with our salvation, that begins with knowing that we are depraved people and selfish people to begin with, and that we constantly need uh, salvation. Does that mean that niceness does not matter? Well, if we kind of look at that in relationship to what Fargo's doing, you might say, no, it kind of doesn't matter because you know the, the stakes of the world that we see in Fargo, the sort of extremities of violence, the way that people die and live for no apparent reason, the way things all fall apart, politeness is not enough to, to, to push back against that. Our goodness is not enough to push back against this. However, it is important in the same way that Marge Gunderson talks about right there in that clip that we just watched. That caring for other people, loving one another, recognizing that people matter more than money or power or even politeness, that's the demonstration of the work of salvation. In John 13, uh, the writer records this kind of long prayer and speech that Jesus gives to his disciples right before he goes off to the cross, including these interesting lines from chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Notice what he says there. Not, people will know you are my disciples. People will know that you are followers of Christ if you are polite, if you do nice things, if you do good things, if you avoid doing bad things. Rather, he simply says, love one another, care for one another, respect one another. All people show them respect and then people will see me through that. And that's kind of what Marge is getting at there. And so it's not to say that niceness and politeness and all of those things are not important, because they absolutely are. But as Fargo illustrates for us, that's not enough, and that can be absurd and almost profane in the face of a world like this. That's not how people know what Christ has done in the coming of his kingdom. Rather, they only know by caring for one another. And throughout its kind of weird violence and absurdity that we get in Fargo, this bit with Marge, just, just loving her husband, loving people that she runs into, even if she kind of dislikes them, that's a good illustration of that. That's the way that we need to behave with one another. That's how people know that we are disciples of Christ.